Mr. Jeremy, my friend. You can go ahead and continue, sir. So, in 2006, um, Pelican Bay got tired of all the gang activity and everything that was going through. Um, because even though we didn't have cell phones and we didn't have, uh, you know, really a whole lot of contact with the outside world, we were still able to get messages out. Um, we were able to utilize people that were pulling from the shoe or leaving the shoe because they had any term and shoe terms mixed in with guys that um, that were doing determined shoes. And so we were able to use them, you know, the old school way of sending kites from one institution to another. Um, it's not like what they have today. Today uh, they use cell phones. They call one place, and the next place, and, you know, uh, bodies drop in within hours. Uh, back in the 90s, it took us... Uh, it took us a few weeks, if not a couple of months, to get messages from one institution to another. So in 2006, they created what they called the Shark Corridor. Now, the Shark Corridor was always existed. It was just, um, instead of having six buildings in the hallway, there was only four. And so it was D1, D2, D3, and D4. And what they did was they moved all of the validated gang members. Well, most of the validated gang members, they moved what they called the worst of the worst. Over here to uh, over to where uh, they can control us. Um, there was no movement inside those corridors. Uh, whenever we would go to medical, we'd go to medical with each other. There was no communication outside. Um, visiting had they put uh, two cameras in the visiting booths, one facing the visitor and one facing us, so that uh, the visitor uh, we they can see what the visitor was telling us. Um, they were recording attorney visits. Um, they were, uh, every movement, everything that we had was controlled. Every piece of mail that came in, every magazine, um, the pages were gone through, newspapers were looked at. I mean, there there was absolutely no communication um, with the outside or very, I mean, every once in a while something would, might, may slip through, but there was none. I remember, uh, you know, talking to dudes that swore up and down they were in communication with people up there on the shoe, and they weren't. They were who they were in communication with was 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 with squad. These dudes used to send kites up there and letters, thinking that they were being slick, and squad would would uh, answer them back, and um, <laughs> they were uh, giving information to squad without knowing about it. Um, I found that out when I was, uh, you know, when I debriefed. Um, that's a whole. Uh, that's a this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. That's a good story right there. Well, anyway, so in, two, in 2006, um, we they moved all over there, and that's when the infighting uh, started. And it's gang members, being a gang member, I found out was like living in a pack of hyenas. Um, if we had nobody to fight, we would fight amongst ourselves. And it was when the politics got the worst. So your uh, people were campaigning against each other. Um, people were. Uh, uh, I would hear the little secrets, the little dirty secrets about each member. Um, you know, like you know, here this member, he has two rape charges on him, but they still want to make him a member. Um, this one right here locked up, or they thought he he was ratting. You know, 20 years ago. This one, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of shit. Um, there was one that uh, they wanted to bring in named uh, Brent Daniels. Uh, he was a blood on the streets, and they ended up making him a member. Um, I mean, it's just, it, it was crazy what was going on because guys wanted power. And what they were doing was uh, they were trying any way they could to rewrite the rules to, to get numbers in their, in their favor. So I'm sitting over here in in the short, in the short corridor, all by myself, single celled, and I'm seeing all this. I'm seeing all the dirty politics, and I'm going, "What the fuck did I get myself involved with?" And I was never good with politics. Um, you know, I was a I was a soldier brother. I was the one that go put in the work. I was the one that um, that that uh, that something would be done, my hand would be the first one to be raised. I remember talking to a brother, uh, it was Rick Rainey, and I was talking to him. Um, this was before we went to the short order, and I, was, I just got made, and I was telling him one day, I said, hey, brother, you know, uh, man, you know, I'm, 
I, I just hope that I can live up to some of the expectations that you guys, you know, have done. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, dude, I've heard all kinds of stories about you guys, you and Corn Fed and, and all these other dudes. And he started laughing. And he goes, check it out. He goes, hey, brother. He goes, right now you've done more than most of us have done. I said, what do you mean? He goes, dude, you know, your your history, your uh, resume is is bigger than even Corn Fed's right next door. I go, nah, it's bullshit. He goes, dude, let me tell you a little bit about Corn Fed. And he starts running down, and dude really hasn't done shit. He goes, you know, no one's done nothing except maybe back in the 80s, but then when it was wide open. Um, he goes, he goes, in, 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 he was just, and that opened my eyes. And John told me one time, he said, look, we live off of legends. Um, if someone, you know, never go around and tell a lie, never tell something that you didn't do, but if someone thinks you did it, there's no reason for you to correct them. Let them believe whatever they want to believe, and it will just snowball down effect, and that's what these dudes have done. And um, like uh, Corn Fed, for example, you know, his claim to fame was stabbing a lawyer, you know, in the courtroom, in handcuffs, you know, trying to. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, he, I'm sure everyone's heard of Corn Fed Schneider, but uh, I remember when he uh, debriefed, when he checked in. Um, it was during the little dog, uh, the dog uh, uh, fiasco with, uh, in San Francisco, those press of canarios. You know, some broad on the news seen him and said, uh, hey, you know, the night stalker didn't rape me. This dude raped me. This is the guy that raped me. Well, we all seen it on the news. It was on Fox 40 News. And three days later, the uh, inspectors from uh, San Francisco uh, inspectors showed up pulled him out to get some DNA from him, and he refused. You know, the next day, he ends up locking up, you know, a couple of days later. And Dale was his silly, you know what I mean? And he didn't do jack shit. So here's, you know, you know, big-ass corn fed being taken out for suspect of being a rape, and his silly didn't do nothing. But it's funny is everyone that seen it kept it quiet. Everybody was scared to say anything because, um, you know, you, you cannot talk shit about a brother. And you know, so uh, <laughs> I got I got plenty of stories about that. So in the short corridor, we're we're campaigning against each other. We're fighting. Um, there was a guy named Todd Asker, Todd Asker and Danny Truxel. So Todd was and Danny. So when these guys went out for their uh, RICO act, uh, Danny was put in the commission on the commission. So he had a little bit of authority. Well, him and Todd were tight. So Todd was using him to get some shit done. Um, they wanted to vote to do away with the council. Um, they wanted to make it uh, a voting block. So whoever, whatever we voted on, would be uh, would be the rules. Um, and not that there weren't many rules. There really weren't rules for the brothers. As a brother, we made our own rules. Um, when I came in, there was only three rules that I had to abide by. Uh, the brand comes first, never be a coward, and uh, never work uh, work with law enforcement. And those are the only three rules that, that I was told I had to follow. Um, anything else, they didn't give a fuck about. And uh, so, um, don't get me wrong, there was some stuff that was discouraged, but they didn't care. So, John and John Stinson, Rick Turflinger, uh, uh, Dave Chance, um, Gary Littrell all come back from the feds. They all come back from the feds. Well, John and Rick say, look, we're done. We're, we're retiring. We're leave us alone. We're done. Um, uh, Gary gets back in the mix, and Dave jumps right back in the mix. Well, everybody wants me to get at John to find out what happened, you know, because he's been out to court for, you know, four or five years. So I go to the law library and uh, they do two scoops. Brent Daniels goes goes over there with us, and I'm trying to get you know information from John. And John's telling me, "Hey, checks out. Um, you know, I'm, I'm done with this. You know, I, I went to court. Every conversation I ever had was on tape. You know, they knew about it. I'm done. This is a young man's game. I'm done. And I'm trying to look. These guys want. He goes, "Look, I give you my power. I give you my positions. Up. Everything that I have is yours now." Well, I already knew that I couldn't accept it. 
there was no way that I could, you know, I could do that. So I'm telling Nah, just he goes, look, I'm done. So we come back. Uh, two scoops runs to Todd and tells Todd, hey, John said he's done. Todd gets at me and says, hey, fuck him. He's, uh, he's, you know, that's it. He wants to be done. He's in the hat. He's fucking. It's over. So I, so I said, look, just let the, just let him retire. Just let him be done. That's that's John Stinson. So I convinced them based on my reputation and you know the clout that I had just to let John still there and be quiet. So for the next couple of years, I mean, we're politicking, and it was some dirty ass politics. Um, we had, uh, and during this time, we suspected that Richard Miley was working for the feds um, because it was just there was a bunch of little stuff that would happen, and we suspected he was working for the feds. And that's a big no-no. You're not supposed to talk amongst brothers um, about someone like that. You know, if, if, you, if you think a brother's a rat, then you need to go to the commission. There's a whole process for it. So we were, we were talking about this, and um, the hunger strikes come up. And during the hunger strikes, uh, John finds out about it and says, hey, the, the hunger strikes, what, what are you, the fuck are you doing? We don't do that. That's not what we do. We don't do hunger strikes. And so I said, look, this is what they're pushing. This is what's going on. This is what Todd's got set in place. He goes, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get at Chunky and uh, get the Council of Three into five and get Kim Wood and I back on, a guy named Ken Johnson, get us back on the council. Well, that fucking dude, Two Scoops, was right there. So he hears it. And he runs back and tells Todd because he was Todd's little uh, little bitch, his little gopher. And so you have 60 seconds remaining. We were getting ready to do the hunger strikes. I was uh, it was me, Todd Asker, Danny Truxel, um, Ronnie Endell. Uh, we were all coming together and we were sending letters out and campaigning. Um, getting all the all the wives together, we got the MA on board, we got the NF on board, which was a tremendous thing. Um, we had the BT, uh, uh, BGF on board, um, so we had all the major prison gangs on board to go around uh, do this hunger strike, and uh, we reached out to all these organizations, um, the prison organizations that help prisoners and um, all the nonprofits, and they were all on board. Um, and so they reached out to their followers and, you know, critical resistance, uh, prison focus, um, you know, uh, all these little places that, that, you know, send newsletters out to the, to the inmates and their families. So now we were able to reach almost everybody in the state of California. Um, and so John Stenson heard about this and he, when he got wind of it, he pulls me to the law library. So what we used to do is we would sign up for the law library, and our building would go, and we would be put next to each other in the cages, and we'd be able to talk a little bit. Not a whole lot, because as soon as you start talking, they came, cuffed us up, and took us right back to ourselves. Um, sometimes they, you know, we'd get five, ten minutes. Sometimes uh, we'd only get 30 seconds. So uh, we go over to the law library, and once again, uh, Two Scoops comes over there with us to uh, kind of spy on it. To spy on us, um, I, I kind of found out later that uh, you know he was uh, he was stuck in Todd's dick to become a brother, and uh, he would do whatever Todd asked him to do. And Todd was uh, Todd wanted him to keep uh, tabs on, on me and John because he knew we were close. So we're all over the law library, and John's telling me, "Hey, check this out, man. Um, I don't know what the hell's going on, but we don't do hunger strikes. Uh, where the hell does idea come from?" Now remember, John, you know, came back from the feds, uh, from the Federal RICO Act, and wanted to step back. And uh, everybody was pissed. Well, not everybody. Uh, Todd, Danny, all these dudes that I found out later had uh, little issues with them. Were all pissed and kind of wanted to put them in the hat and cut them loose. And based on my word, we uh, we made a decision to let him sit there and retire. So I tell John, you know, the what's going on. He tells me, he goes, hey, look, he goes, let's uh, get with Chunky and make the commission three into five. So the Aryan Brotherhood in California uh, is kind of, is uh, is ran by the commission. Um, it's been different throughout the years. There was a commission and a council, and then there was just a commission, no council. So at this time, there was just a commission of three. 
uh, which is uh, it's kind of based on what the feds are, uh, the federal system is too. So to change it from three to a five is kind of you know irregular. So anyway, so I tell John, you know what? Because he's my he was my partner, he was my friend, he's the one that brought me in. Um, I said, hey, don't even trip. I'll get back. I'll, I'll get with Chunky. Because uh, at this point, I started to see the scandalousness that was going on with uh, with Todd and Danny, and I started seeing some of the, uh, the, the manipulations that was going on. And uh, I wanted to be on the kind of the winning team, and I figured John would have my back because around this time, I wasn't too sure if Ronnie and, and, and all them guys had my back. So I come back, and true to form, uh, two scoops runs out to the yard and gets a message over to Todd. Goes out and tells Todd, "Hey, this is what you know, uh, Zaff and John were talking about." So Todd gets at me, and uh, well, actually, Todd has Danny get at me, and Danny comes and says, "Hey, check out, man. Um, you know what's what, what was going on? What, what was said?" So I told him, "Hey, you know, John wants back on the council. He wants me to get at uh, get at Chunky." He goes, hey, nah, check this out. Fuck John. You got your. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. He tells me, fuck John. Um, you know, here's the deal. Hey, fuck that dude. We're going to have him killed. Uh, uh, cut him loose. You know, uh, make sure he's isolated and, uh, and and don't communicate with him at all. I told him, hey, f you know, who are you to tell me what I can and can't do? I'm not doing that. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, he goes, oh, I'm giving you a direct order. I told him, yeah, fuck you and your direct order. You, you ain't on the council. You ain't fucking, we're all equals here. You can't give me a fucking direct order. And so he got pissed off. He went inside uh, the next yard day. I was out there. Now, we're at Pilkin Bay Shoe. Um, and I know it kind of sounds kind of strange, but we used to talk between the walls. So we would go out to the little shoe yard and... They're, you know, 12-foot concrete walls with a, a corrugated metal on the top, kind of expanded metal on the top. And uh, on the side where the walls would be, we would spend months uh, digging out little uh, little channels so we can talk between yards. And that's what we were talking about right there in the corner. So Todd comes out, tells me, hey, man, checks out. You got to cut dude loose and, and fuck that dude. And I tell him, nah, you know what I mean? Well, at this point, at this point, they all know that I know all their little shit. I know their little scandalous ways that they were going. I know what they were trying to push. Um, uh, you know, uh, with Evans, uh, Sparky, you know, with the, the the scandalous shit he was doing, the scandalous shit that Ronnie was doing. And so they didn't want me to get with John. So they started their little campaign. And so they sent John a kite and, tell, and, and told John, hey, look, uh, here's the deal. We'll let you back in because they knew they couldn't stop them. We'll, we'll let you back in, but you got to sit back for two years because you, uh, you, you know, you, get, you said you were done, and we gave you that opportunity. Um, Zaps got to sit back with you for two years. Let us finish what we're doing before you guys come back in. Well, my pride wouldn't let me do it. My pride's like, fuck these dudes. I ain't sitting back for shit. So John gets at me and says, hey, um, I don't know exactly what's going on. But uh, here's the deal. Sit back for two years, and once we get back, once I get back in there, these dudes are dead. These dudes are gone. We'll, we'll take care of it. I was like, fuck that. I ain't stepping back. So they started their little campaign. They quit talking to me. Um, they kind of put me on the shine in that little crew right there. And uh, the, you know, I had brothers on the other side of the of the hallway. They were still getting at me, getting at, hey, what's going, what the fuck's going on? They're saying some crazy shit about you. And I had a, a friend of mine that was over there, Spider, and uh, him and I came up together. And so I intercepted a kite that said that I was talking shit about Smiley, you know, saying he was a rat. And they were using that to, and this is another brother, they were using that to uh, to say that I was sitting here bad-mouthing brothers behind their back. And so they started this little this little smear campaign, and it was I started to see it. Holy shit! And these dudes that I trusted, these dudes that I called brothers, these dudes that I put work in with for, you know, are all fucking uh, you know uh, stepping uh, stabbing me in the back. 
And I remember yelling over to Spider one day, saying, hey, man, you know, what's up, dude? And he's ignoring me. I was like, hey, you know this is bullshit. You know exactly where all that shit came from. And I put it all out there on the tier for the whole fucking building here. And he still didn't say nothing. Um, uh, six months after I debriefed, he debriefed. He sent me word saying that he should have spoke up, that he knew the shit was wrong. Um, but that's how powerful that gang is. It's how powerful those ties are. Uh, the truth is what we is what we believe it to be, and uh, the the fear behind going against everybody is is a big factor in this in the organization. Um, it's it's about the popular ones. It's about the ones that are uh, if you control the message, you control everything. So. After a while, they were they were closing uh, closing me out. I was losing my connections with the MA. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I was clo- I was losing my connections with uh, the uh, the NF. I had business dealings going on with both of them. Um, the only and slowly but surely, I was being stranglehold. They were trying to bring me to heal, but my pride wouldn't let me wouldn't let me do it. There was a uh, there was a white dude next door to me named Duke Bolter who uh, I shot down from being a brother years before, and uh, they made him a brother overnight just to, uh, just to spite me to have another uh, vote in their, in, their, in, in their little agenda they were doing. So this was, this was around 2000, this was around 2011, 2012, um, and uh, uh, it's already been a couple of years that I sat back and I started watching and I started seeing seeing it for what it was. I started seeing the corruption in it, and I'll get into that later. Uh, some of the backstabbings and the and the lies and the deceit that we were doing, um, the infighting and and all that. But uh, so I'm sitting here for a year and uh, just watching just watching the lies, watching the bullshit, being isolated uh, in my little section right there. And it wasn't until the BGF came to me one day, and uh, they uh, they tell me, hey, you know, we heard Todd talking shit. They thought you would be gone by now, and uh, they thought you were locked up a long time ago. And uh, they're they're kind of afraid of you right now. They're, they they're tripping that you're still around, and they don't know who you're talking to. He goes, uh, but uh, we talked to Chunky, and Chunky said that he still has your back. Now I'm tripping here. Here's our mortal enemies, if you will, the you know the Black Willow family, helping me out and passing a message and uh, and speaking up for me. And I'm sitting here thinking, what the fuck is going on? Blacks have my back more than my own people. And so you know, so I'm, I'm tripping, and the thought comes to my mind to debrief, to uh, de- uh, debrief, to be done with it. And I start thinking, what the fuck's wrong with you? You know, where, where did this thought come from? Fuck this. You know what I mean? What's, what the fuck? You have 60 seconds remaining. Hey, you want me to call you back? Yeah. 